Okay, great. Well, first of all, um, thanks to, I mean, I can't believe I'm here sitting with Mike Wish and, and Gardner Campbell here at the same time. And um, this is, uh, first of all, thanks a lot for this interview. I know it's uh, some time from more interesting stuff at the ELI conference. But um, I, I just want to, to take advantage of having both of you here and uh, begin asking you something that has been discussed at this conference. And actually, what I, I mean, I'm working on the, the mythology around teaching and learning. And uh, actually, the, the last, um, the last um, slides of Chris Didi was, uh, that there was a nice quote there, unlearn unconscious assumptions about learning and teaching, etc. that sort of clicked with what I'm, I'm trying to understand. So I would like first to ask you, what do we have to unlearn? What do you think you, do we have to unlearn? That's my first. You want to kick it off? <laughs> Where to start? <laughs> I, I think one of the things, and this is a... This is what I run into uh, in my own work on faculty development a lot, is that we have to unlearn the thought that no authentic, uh, credentializable, it's a terrible word, uh, learning can happen without a, a teacher's direct intervention. So my uh, colleagues typically get very worried when I say, for example, with blogs, which I, I encourage them to use, how will I ever read all of them? How will I ever comment on all of them? How will I ever, and, and they're trying to be responsible, but I think what's happening is they're also reflecting an unconscious assumption that if they haven't responded to everything the student did, if they haven't somehow been a part of every conversation that could generate meaning within a learning experience, that they're not doing their jobs. You know, what are they there to do if not to certify every student remark as promising or somehow misleading. What, what am I supposed to do as a teacher if I'm not there to, not so much to control the conversation, but to keep putting a stamp of approval on everything that's happening, uh, a kind of proctoring? And I tell them, no, your job as a teacher is not to be a proctor. Your job as a teacher uh, is gonna be richer and uh, not as easy to manage uh, as that. And you're you're not going to be able to read and comment on every single post. You're not going to be able to respond to every single thing a student says, and you shouldn't, because then the students won't talk to each other. They'll only talk to you. Um, students are very quick to pick that up, that what they've said didn't really happen unless a teacher heard it. And I try to say, no, no, we need to do this in a different way. There still is a role for the teacher to be able to assess and guide the student. Absolutely, I'm not saying that the teacher is completely hands off. But if there's a rich conversation going on in my class that I didn't start and I'm not contributing to, that's fine. I think it's good for students to see that spontaneous learning can break out. Uh, and if I've prepared an environment where that's more likely, then I think I've done a good job. So that's one, and I say, I try to say this carefully because I think sometimes it's because faculty want to control things. But often it's because faculty believe that it's part of their duty as an intellectual and a faculty member to be in there at every moment certifying or responding somehow to what the students are doing. And I think we have to unlearn that. So there's like this, there's a sense of, of losing control and going with the flow of, I mean, learning is a flow, right? And sort of getting into that flow. And then the other aspect of learning is that really deep learning is not just hard, it, uh, it's it's like Thomas Oz talks about how, you know, every act of learning is is like a is like a wound to yourself, <laughs> right? It's like it's a certain depth. You mind of if I self. take notes? That's really <laughs> great. No, no, I'm serious. I'm it like it like down. it yeah. wounds you, right? Yep. Like, it uh -huh. like, and 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 that's yeah. why unlearning I think is so hard because when you talk about unlearning, I mean every piece of learning in a sense has a little bit of unlearning in it because you have yes. to sort of break down a, a part of your previous self to allow this new thing in, and. Um, and that's especially hard in, in front of a classroom because we know that modeling that is what is best. Yes. But on the other hand, every time you model that, you're, you're undercutting your own authority, which is what we think we're supposed to be doing, which allows us to do the certification that you're talking about. And uh, 
you know, I, uh, this, this leads back to the, the core problem in any sort of getting faculty to transform. I did like a little uh, thing. I had 400 faculty at a university and, and I, they had me do a keynote and then, and then we did this big discussion. And as part of this big discussion, I decided I would have everybody stand up and do a cluster thing where they would like cluster themselves um, based on one question. The question was, what keeps you from changing? What keeps you from transforming? And they all had to write this word down and then they would cluster around these different words. And you had, uh, there was like a, a small group of people in the corner who said money. Like, I don't have the support. And another smaller group said, uh, I don't have like the, the professional development support. Very small group. And then there was this big, huge group. Just like, I was like, aren't you guys going to separate yourselves out? I said, no, we're all the same group. Fear. Wow. <laughs> it, was like, oh my. it was like 350 of them were afraid. And I think it's because of this yep. like wound to the self that has to happen. Yeah, what is the role I will play in a world in which I've been transformed? Mm -hmm. uh, there's, so one of my favorite movies is Vertigo. Mm. And it's a very rich concept. It's, it's, you know, at times in the movie it's pathological. But at other times in the movie it's that feeling that you, your world has come unstuck when you, when you fall in love mm -hmm. or when you become really obsessed by something or in the grip of an idea. And, you know, that takes an enormous amount of courage to do in front of people mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Yeah. because it means for that moment you're not going to be cool, you're not going to be <laughs> calm, you're not going to be collected. You're, you're, right. you're going to be dizzy. Yeah. And you're open up to do that when you're young because your hormones and everything in you <laughs> tells you to be ready for transformation. No, right? I think that's an important point. There is a kind of priming that happens, uh, yeah. you know, when you're an yeah. adolescent that, that you eventually lose because the world is hard to manage. Yeah. Well, and there's also this, it's like we're, we're constantly walking up to this cliff and how much, you know, it depends on how much is at stake in jumping across. And w when you're young, there's this hope for new meaning on the other side, and, and you're gonna do it, you're gonna leap. <laughs> like, even if you fall, you're like, I'm willing to take that risk because there's new meaning on the other side of this. And I think as we get older, we get very comfortable. Like, like it's sort of like, my life is good enough. Like, my, the way I see the world is good enough. It works for me. So it takes a lot more to jump, jump across that gap. And faculty are really good examples of this, you know, because they have good, secure, comfortable lives. They're at the head of their field in thinking in a certain way, and it's hard for them to sort of break out and say, I'm going to rebuild. My, oh, yeah. You know. yeah. Listen, uh, uh, sorry. No, I was just going to say that it's also difficult and ironic that the security of a tenured academic's life, which should encourage <laughs> jumping off of any cliff you can find, uh, has exactly the opposite effect. Yeah. Um, and it's also, it seems to me, a shame in a, especially uh, uh, in a, in a democracy in which a lot of people are working pretty hard so I can live a pretty comfortable, secure life, that I'm not modeling the cliff jumping. Citizens need to be able to have that skill. And instead, uh, we've erected all of these interesting structures within higher education in particular that say, no, really what you want to do is be inert. Um, that's, uh, that's a terrible thing. And I would also add here, and I'd be very interested to know what you two have to say about this. There's a feeling, I think, that to be intellectually rigorous, you must be adversarial. Mm. Yep. Oh, I hate that. <laughs> and, and, and if you have not become adversarial, or if you do not, do not somehow invite an adversarial response, yeah. you're not being a rigorous thinker. And what that leads to is this very complicated pathology in which you're a part-time pit bull and a part-time person cowering in the corner. Right. And, and what gets lost is that middle space where you're playing, yeah. where you're exploring. Yeah, you know, I mean, we, we all like, we really champion critical thinking, all of us do, but so much of the time cynicism passes for criticism, like effective criticism, right? And it, it's just pervasive in, throughout uh, academe, you know? And I, th I find it's actually much more difficult to do a different type of thinking, not not so much critical thinking, but you might call it connective thinking or empathic thinking. And it's like when you, you could take Shakespeare and you could sort of break it down critically, right? But you could also take Shakespeare and try to get inside of it and try to empathize with it and, and sort of feel it, from, feel it out from the inside. And that actually seems to be much more difficult for everybody, uh, students and faculty alike. And it's something that I keep nudging 
my students to do and I try to model in the classroom, it's like they all come in with the text and they think from day one what they're supposed to do is show, show me how clever they are by breaking it down and showing me how it's wrong. I'm like, well, can you show me how it's right? Like, there's, there's an essence here. There's something brilliant here. Something, a door open that maybe wasn't open for you before. Like, let's talk about that. I think there's a fear of naivete. I think faculty are terribly afraid to appear unsophisticated mm -hmm. in front of each other. And real sophistication, to me, is, is that reaching inside and the pulling together is much more complicated. It's like what we were talking about with the analytics panel yeah. yesterday. Um, you know, tearing apart is one thing. Analysis can do that. But analysis can also show you complexity and, and show you a door you walk through to do a, a, a rich thing. Um, but for some reason, and I keep thinking about this, that, uh, that seems to be bred out, uh, especially of graduate school, and part of it has to do with status, uh, and part of it has to do with, I think, this, this misguided uh, idea that the, the thing to do is really the terror part. Yeah, you know, in, in my field, in anthropology, there's, it's all about criticism, and I mean, it's heavy stuff, right? I mean, we, we follow the lit crit tradition in this. I mean, we borrow most of our theories from that. And it just becomes this sort of very convoluted kind of ongoing bash of everybody. Right? Yes, <laughs> and, that's right. And what happens then is like, is people get through their three years of coursework on their way to a PhD, and then they go out in the field, and then they have to write about something. And suddenly they realize that they have to not, they can't just write their whole dissertation criticizing everybody that came before them. They actually have to create something. And that critical voice is there in the background, and they just are stuck. They can't create anything. Oh, that's right. And so they, you know, average time to PhD is something like 11 to 12 years in anthropology. And I think it has a lot to do with those first three years. Nobody's modeling. That, well, that, gosh, the type of thing that anthropology got started with, like pattern recognition and mm -hmm. bringing things together. I mean, there's some wonderful stuff written prior to the 1950s by people who are sort of seeing bigger patterns and showing us these things and not just tearing each other down, but actually building on each other's work. So this is the problem of the grand narrative, and you've brought this up yeah. many times. You know, the grand narrative that we have learned uh, since the days of high theory is that there is no grand narrative, and anyone who proposes a grand narrative should be shot on sight. But that's a terrible grand narrative. <laughs> when you get to the grand narrative that there is no grand narrative, you're essentially saying, you fool, don't try to make meaning out of any of this except this particular gesture. Here's a contrary example that I think will point to the thing yeah. that you're advocating. Uh, I had a wonderful professor in graduate school named Karen Chase who wrote a book uh, on uh, Eros and Psyche. It's an old, it's a wonderful old uh, myth that has to do with essentially the marriage of heart and head. Uh, Psyche uh, is the powers of mind and analysis, and she's given these tasks of sorting seeds and so forth, really classic analytical stuff. But it's for the sake of love, because she's been wounded mm -hmm. by, by Cupid, and she's in love, and she has in turn wounded Cupid, and he's in love. So, uh, and Venus is very touchy, right? The mother <laughs> does not like this match. But there's this larger pattern of how do you unite the analytical power with, with this yearning that we have for community. And at the end of the book, that Karen Chase wrote about this, she said something that I have never and, and can never forget. Uh, she said, there comes a time at the end of every analysis when the critic must put down her pen and simply gesture mutely back at the work that inspired the criticism. This is now that time. Mm -hmm. And that's the end. That's and a nice I, metaphor. <sighs> Love it. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> I'd like to see more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So w a, a few a few people would say to talking about narratives that they feel sort of imprisoned by the 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 big narrative of their own content. There is a sort of a mm. tyranny of content. Well, what do you say, especially to people in the sciences? I'm one of those people actually, mm. who say, well, yes, but my courses are fit in in into a bigger uh, context, and so what, what should I do? What, what's my role there? <laughs> <laughs> You're the science person. <laughs> well, this is, this is a question about disciplines in some ways. Yeah. Uh, be, yeah. Uh, so 
So we have a ringer here, ladies and gentlemen. I simply want to point this out. <laughs> Tell us again what the subject matter of anthropology is, Dr. Yeah. Wesch. It's the study of all humans in all times in all places. <laughs> <laughs> the, obviously the queen of disciplines. <laughs> yeah. so, so, so I would be really interested to hear what you have to say about that kind of disciplinary, right. you know, permissiveness and almost uh, boundlessness. It's, I'm, I have discipline envy, so. Yeah, <laughs> right. Well, I mean, so our problem is, I mean, there might be some leeway that's given to me, actually, because our discipline is so broad, right? And it's impossible to cover everything, so coverage isn't necessarily an issue. It's more becomes uh, a matter of inspiring the right mindset. So like premium goal of an anthropology course is to inspire uh, the anthropological perspective or the anthropological imagination. And that, I think, translates well to science in a lot of ways. If you think about what you can cover in any given STEM class, whether it's science, biology, chemistry, uh, physics, you know, any of those sciences there, uh, you would be in a situation where you can't possibly cover all the ground anyway. And it gets to be more and more the case. Like I talked to friends of mine in biology, and I'm all excited about something new I heard about in biology, and I'll say, oh, are you guys, so do you guys talk about this? You should use this yeah. when you talk about this. <laughs> they oh, no, oh, no, we don't talk about that. That's, we've already filled it up. Yeah, <laughs> no. yeah that's <laughs> a tragedy. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and, and it is hard, right? Because, I mean, a good biology class 30 years ago you know, and it was, you know, full of a certain storyline, a certain matter of content. Now it's, now it has to be, you have, you have to fit genetics inside there and all kinds of other things. I mean, biochemistry has to fit in there somehow. And, and it just doesn't all fit. But you can still teach or inspire curiosity and wonder and along with some, some rigor, the scientific method, all those types of things. And hopefully what happens is I mean, realistically, you only have about, let's say, 40 hours, maybe, in a given semester with your students. I mean, what can you do in 40 hours, really, in the life of a scientist? The best you can do in those 40 hours is inspire them to be a scientist. Yeah. <laughs> and, and model out the, the scientific method, for instance, which, which gets most often out mm. of the classroom. That's yeah. very, very sad. Amazing, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, you know, um, yeah, uh, a friend of mine who's, who's a physicist at K-State brought his, this is many years ago, uh, but he brought his eight-year-old daughter to the, the classroom, and, and he said, so this is where I teach, and he said, where, 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 where do the stu students go? And he said, well, they sit in these seats here, it's like amphitheater, like 200 people, and she's like, and they just sit there? <laughs> and he, he just like, he just immediately realized, yeah. like, you're right. Like, <laughs> this makes no sense in teaching science that they would just sit yeah. there. <laughs> yeah, and what you were talking before about curiosity, uh, Garner wrote a piece in the in the campus technology about this curiosity network, mm. augmentation network. No, I think that that that's really the the thing, the, the inspiration thing. But uh, going going to this this idea of a big crisis that we have, I think this is another myth. Per, which is uh, totally true in a way, but we have very different views of this crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, each one has its own his own interpretation. So, I would like you to say something on the crisis and also on something that both of you feel, even perhaps not necessarily expressing it explicitly always, which is the the fact that many things that are happening in education today are politics things, uh, and they should be dealt with accordingly. The LMS issue with big publishers going back uh, through the back door is a, is, a is a politics thing. So crisis and politics. Hmm. Well, uh, so one of my heroes, and many other people have him as a hero as well, is Larry Lessig. And he's fought the good fight and done, I think, astonishing work in, in freeing up our ideas of what intellectual property can mean and what copyright is there for. He's now changed um, his focus, and his focus is now on doing what they tell you to do. If you want to understand why things happen in a political arena, follow the money. So that's what he's doing, and his, uh, his project now is to try to reform uh, the way in which uh, Congress uh, and people in, in government are, um, are given money, the way money influences what they do, and so forth. And I think that we should follow the money 
in higher ed as well. Uh, I, I think it's um, way past time. We're seeing some uh, stirrings right now of scientists rebelling against Elsevier and the way that research produced within a not-for-profit organization then gets sold to uh, or through a, essentially a process we've created for our own uh, credentialing in many cases, gets, finds its way to Elsevier, which then bundles it together and sells the results of the research at the university back to the university at, at a very large price. Interestingly, there, it was a mathematician at, uh, I believe at Cambridge, uh, who wrote a blog post, imagine that, uh, that was very influential in starting people to be thinking about, wait a minute, that's right, what is this about, could we do this differently? We faculty construct this knowledge together, what if we simply didn't submit it to a peer-reviewed journal owned by Elsevier? Now, this is a difficult thing to do because, as in any political situation, there's this symbiotic thing that's happened. If there is corruption, there are people who would themselves not be directly corrupted, but benefit from the system that's grown up around it. Uh, I'm trying to speak very carefully and diplomatically here. Um, <laughs> because it's a crisis also of conscience. Now, if somebody at Cambridge who's won the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in mathematics decides to withhold his writing from an Elsevier-owned journal, then probably he's going to be okay. But what my colleagues will say to me is, if I don't present at this conference sponsored by an LMS, I will not get the recognition. And even more heartbreakingly, if, if I don't speak at a conference sponsored by an LMS, then I can't reach the people who need to hear the message about not relying on an LMS. <laughs> that said, if you criticize a sponsor during a talk, <laughs> uh, you, face, uh, you face a series of consequences. Uh, whether you uh, set out to do that deliberately or whether uh, it, it happens as a part of uh, one's uh, academic uh, uh, outlook and freedom. Uh, and so it becomes very, very delicate. I, I don't have a single answer to this. Uh, in some ways, it was the problem, it's the problem of the uh, Protestant Reformation all over again. Uh, Martin Luther, convinced of the corruption of the Catholic Church, broke with the Church. Erasmus, convinced that something had to be done to reform from within, uh, stayed where he was. Uh, people of goodwill may differ mm. on how best to address the problem of the political corruption and the and it, it all comes down to money in the end. I don't know what else it would come down to. Um, but I think we need to agree on a couple of things. One is to call it when we see it in a, in a way that's not vindictive or mean, sure. but very, very clear that this is not acceptable. And the second is to stay in conversation about it because none of us can figure out these complex ethical issues by ourselves. That's what I take a polis to be for, that we can actually talk about this and debate it. Um, I think that's very important. Uh, and I think that the worst corruption is when you're in a situation in which that debate is squelched for reasons of politics. Then you're really in a very bad place. But that debate actually is being uh, censored from within our own institutions. Yes, it is. And that's the, the, yeah, the, the bad thing. Yeah, there's multiple levels of that. I mean. Um, for, <laughs> you have to speak so carefully <laughs> when you do these yeah. things. But, um, yes, and we're not even in the Soviet Union. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's surprising. And that, I guess that indicates the level of the problem. And, and the thing that you hint at there is, just as an example, um, discussion, like lively discussion about these types of issues is often taken as from by administrators or people in the political realm as sort of off message, right? Like, like you're not on message anymore. It's like, well, I'm debating with my colleagues over here. And the fact that other people are listening in from out, outside, like that doesn't mean it's the message of this university or this conference. It's just part of the discussion we're trying to have. And that's part of the academic freedom that we should be allowed. And yet, you know, people in communications and marketing departments or in, you know, who have a vested interest in a certain product looking a certain way, take it instead as not being on message. Mm. <laughs> and that's very disturbing. It's very disturbing. And the fact that the web might take a turn in, in closing mm. upon itself 
to me, it's really very disturbing. We got yeah. a, a fantastic invention here, and it, the, the, the future doesn't seem la that bright. To me. I, you, I don't think that point can be overemphasized. I think you're absolutely right. I think the internet represents something truly rare in human experience. It was designed by very thoughtful people, many of them, most of them within an academic context, and steeped in the idea of the value of what Licklider calls unfettered thought, open inquiry. And they had to fight their way past you know, the Bell system, mm -hmm. past government <laughs> folks. Pentagon. All, all of those people aligned to say, you cannot do this, you must not do this, this and they would criticize them typically by calling them stupid. <laughs> no, this can't possibly work. You know, packet switching, this, no, that can't possibly work. And this is always how academics try to kill each other. They, they say, no, that's stupid. Not that I disagree. And yet we came up with a platform in which innovation can happen on the edge, not just at the center, and in which it's completely data agnostic, application agnostic. As long as it's a packet and you can send it through, you're on. It was harder for me to get an FCC license to be a DJ on the radio than it was for me to buy a domain or set up my blog. Mm. And it wasn't terribly difficult, but I had to pass a test, I had to pay a fee to the government, etc. To get live on the internet as a publisher reaching the world is a matter of $6 a month and uh, $12 for a domain name. And I didn't apply. This is the point. It wasn't even the cost. I didn't have to get a license, just as I don't have to get a license to go out into the public square and say what's on my mind. Now, I may be a lunatic. I may be misguided. Still, but, but still, and we, we could throw that away with both hands. The part that has bothered me the most over the last 10 years is that the central champion should be of the kind of open inquiry that the internet represents as a platform um, have been the most reluctant to adopt it. We, and that's been higher education. We've hidden behind the LMS. We've hidden behind a set of concerns that have some limited applicability like FERPA, but it becomes a conversation stopper. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because people uh, well, there's a whole range of reasons. But unfortunately, what it means is um, people who should be in the vanguard of keeping this web open um, have, uh, have really sort of, uh, they've been in the lead trying to close it down. And I think that's a, I think it's a disgrace. Yeah. Sometimes I think that perhaps the fact that universities have always had a lot of inertia towards accepting innovation, et cetera, so perhaps we still have to learn uh, this new world and to, to in a way, to, to feel ourselves at ease. I hope it's the inertia and slowness. I have seen higher education act in a very agile way when they want to shut something down. Mm. So there, there, there's a quickness of reflex there That's if true. it's to protect. Um, so uh, we can be very agile uh, when we want to be. I'd just like to see that agility move towards uh, innovation as That's well. It's interesting, you, you mentioned crisis as part of the discussion too, and that's one of those words that I think is, uh, well, it's, it, it, we have to be careful with it, right? Because nothing sells like a crisis, <laughs> like, yeah, you know what I mean? Uh, like oh, the, people, sure. the people who love the word crisis are yeah. the same people who are peddling all these things that's, that are supposed to yes, solve the crisis. Yes, really and it's so one of the things I'm careful with is anytime I mention crisis, I also point out that this can be solved for if, if not six dollars a month, possibly even nothing. Right? Yes, that's like, right. Like there are all kinds of free tools, and, and the only way to protect them is to get a large number of people excited about the possibility, so that you know we're educating the next generation. And if they're educated in a way that where they see like, oh wow, I can harness and leverage all these free tools to do amazing things, then that will help protect those things. Yes. Yeah. And in fact, what you're saying is it this crisis in a way a sort of a cover-up uh, for instance I, I think we have very good pedagogies at least at the children level and intermediate level then from that level up I think we're really in the, in the dark uh, but so why elementary school doesn't work I, I, I ask myself so there must be some something between the administration administrative part of managing education 
And the pedagogy, which, which apparently is right, because a lot of schools do it right, and they have big, big, big results. And if we go and see what's happening in Finland, and we, we compare it with our own world, we, we have to say, we have to deduct that. So perhaps we have all the, 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 the media in the sense of the, 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 the instruments, sorry, to do this, but we don't get to it. So here's a thought experiment in the, in the vein of what Chris Didi was just giving us. I, I think that you all are right. I think we have the tools we need uh, to be able to address many of the difficulties we're facing very quickly. What would an Arab Spring look like in higher education? Hmm. What would that be That's nice. if the people who are in <laughs> this culture did what happened in Egypt? They found each other. They knew they weren't alone. What would that be like? The, yeah, I know Cupai, E.D. <laughs> yeah. Yes, although I have to say that uh, even my daughter was starting to complain about the Occupy Wall Street movement in, in that there, there, there didn't seem to be um, a proposal that was emerging. Uh, okay, we understand this is a bad situation. Mm, what do we do now? I don't know if that's fair or not, but I do know that in the situation of the Arab Spring, what happened was a, a lot of... Um, resentment, a lot of impatience, a lot of energy behind that desire for change, suddenly was able to form a critical mass because of the way in which social media uh, demonstrated to them, and Clay Shirky talks about this I think very, very well, it demonstrated to people who wanted to provide resistance that they weren't alone. They weren't going to be isolated by the powers that be, taken out behind the barn and shot at sunrise. They, were, they, they stood strong because they were not alone. Um, what would that be like in higher ed for students to find that they are not alone? I, I look at Reddit and I see their you know sub forum on uh, I want to learn how to learn and you know you can start to see the glimmerings there of what happens if students not just grousing about hard work or whatever but honestly begin to say you know I've I've gone through this system it's not working for me surely I can't be the only one. And then it turns out they're not. I don't know. I don't know what that would look like, but it could happen very quickly and disruptively. But still, you two, you, the both of you, uh, you have uh, explored, in, a sort of intimate, it's just between you and yourself, what, uh, what Mike does within his own classroom, what, what you do. So uh, uh, I think this is a, a great role model for other teachers and for other researchers to, in a way, to both uh, embrace the new things that we have uh, and we can, we can use, and at the same time to introduce perhaps little changes in, in the way we teach, in the way we, we involve our own students in little research about, about stuff that, that we do. That's, that's what I feel in both of your uh, activities, day, day by day. So what, what what would you say, and I mean, I know that you do it every day, no, but what do you say to faculty and to, to, to students who question the value of college, who say, well, uh, uh, there's no value in the money we invest, uh, w w w w with, what you, w with what you do uh, uh, day by day, how would you respond to that, that uh, line of, of questioning, what would you say? Well, <laughs> in part, you know, I think I think uh, the first thing you have to do is 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 confirm their their feelings about it. Like they're right about a lot of those things. I mean, it is very expensive, and there it's questionable whether or not it's worth it at times. So then, but then you have to, you know, say, well, what is it that we provide, and and that's when you start. I think that's when you you not only are sort of selling it to them. Are you talking like a student who's come to you? and Yeah. Said, yeah, so, but you're also sort of trying to reinvigorate the campus community that should be there, <laughs> right? And, and uh, in that sense, I mean, there's no doubt, if I look at my own university, for example, like if that were 
like people talk about the future and how this type of thing might not exist in the future. And I think if that ever happens, somebody would just reinvent it because what's better than bringing 25,000 people together with the purpose of learning? That's right. You know, that's, yeah. that's just a wonderful yeah. thing, right? We've screwed it up with the politics and, and all the type of things that we talked about in this interview. Um, but we could certainly, if it were all gone, I think we'd all lose. We'd, we'd all really want it back, and we would hopefully bring it back renewed and <laughs> hopefully not regenerate the same old politics that sort of kills it. So, so when I think about this, I think about higher education, especially that really critical and interesting four-year period that we've set up arbitrarily, but it's very interesting, mm -hmm. and, it, and especially for the traditionally aged student, and I don't want to exclude yeah. those who are not, but for the traditional age student, it comes at a particularly interesting moment in their cognitive, social, and physical development. I think of it as, an, as not a place where there's going to be the attainment of mastery, except maybe for a few things. I think you can get fairly masterful at writing. You can get fairly masterful at a, at a few things, and you'll certainly get some depth in a particular area of concentration, although all that idea of the major is being rethought. But I think the most important thing that happens in that four years is you're introduced to civilization from the point of view not of just a passive recipient but also of a co-creator. Mm -hmm. I remember when I got to college and I suddenly understood that my horizon of understanding, responsibility, and opportunity as a co-creator of culture right. was far larger than I had ever imagined. And I was a pretty, you know, avid, curious kid. But I got to school, and mostly through the modeling of the professors and the sudden energy of the conversation with my fellow students, because we were together for this purpose, uh, I suddenly saw that the world was not only much larger, but much more susceptible to my own thoughts and creations. So it was odd. It was as if everything expanded, but my own possibilities expanded as well. So I didn't yeah. feel dwarfed by it or daunted by it. I just thought, oh my goodness, if I go flat out with everything I have for as long as I can, <laughs> that's not only what I should do, it's, it's also this enormous opportunity. And, and it was, it was it's, I remember so vividly how invigorating that felt. Yeah. I had the same experience. And for me, the first insight was that the world could be so different. You know, and that's, that's like step one. Yep. And then, and then you're like, and I can co-create this world to be different, <laughs> you know, in different ways. And I mean, that's what turned me on to anthropology, was just sort of exploring other cultures to see how different humans can be, you know? And, and then, but yeah, the co-creator thing is, is really key. The, the thing that really nags at me now is like, it's fairly easy to get students to see that the world could be different. Not, not easy, but, you can, but it, can be, it can be done. That's sort of the step one. But that next step where they realize that they can be co-creators, I think there's a lot of steps in between mm -hmm. there for one. And we could talk about that. But the other thing is just, you know, being a co-creator or taking on that responsibility requires courage. It requires uh, all kinds of things, a sense of empowerment, a sense of connection and meaning. All of that has to be there. All of it is probably best facilitated still in a community, like a physical face-to-face -face community. Um, and yet it's still, it's just really, really hard. And I haven't yet cracked the nut about how that works, but that's sort of my big and that isn't that a fault of the school system, which should, in a way, open up students to... to yeah. Well, I think there, there's this problem of school becomes a, an exercise in how to tick boxes, you know? Right. It's, <laughs> a, it's, a, it's about learning procedures. Yeah, exactly. Uh, right. And I think one of the things that I try to do to um, tease my students into a sense of the possibilities of co-creation uh, maybe tease is the wrong word, nudge or um, awaken, but there is a teasing to it too. I mean, Jerome mm -hmm. Bruner talks about the fine art of intellectual seduction, and, mm -hmm. and I could see that my teachers practiced that on me, and, and that <laughs> made me feel great that they would want to do that with me, and it also, I could look back and I could see, wow, you, you got me loving that. Look <laughs> at that. So I think part of it is that our students, I think, just as 
human beings are naturally learners, we're always reaching out to co-create. One of the things the school does is say, that co-creation that you care about, the fan fiction you write, the records you're listening to, the photographs you take obsessively, that's all well and good. Now we need to sit down and learn procedures. And the, the, the horror of the autodidact, you know, mm -hmm. as if somehow the path dependency of the expert presents fewer problems. I don't think so. You know, this idea that what you do as a free range thinker is all well and good, but now we need to do school. I think that actually is something that teaches students that they're not co-creators yeah, or, that what, or, that, or that what they do is yeah. of no value. And to try to awaken them to say, you see that thing you're doing when you write fan fiction? Actually, that is co-creation. Honor that. Let's explore how many of those possibilities without this kind of subtle way of saying, oh, that's really good as a start. Mm -hmm. Now let me show you what real grown-up people yeah. drink. Now, so, so what do you think then of Chris Didi's comment yesterday when he talked about transfer? And you mentioned it briefly today. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And, so what do you think of that? I mean, it, I didn't know quite what to do with that. Well, I, it's hard. I mean, the problem of transfer is, is one that bedevils learning theory as little as I know about it. I mean, the idea is what do you take with the thing that you do in school and connect that to what you do in your life or even to other things within school? Um, and I think it's because of compartmentalization. I mean, I think it's because we say there are no connections. Do not look within yourself. Come here and we will furnish this to you. It's not real transfer. Uh, it's, it's fake transfer. Mm -hmm. And students just master that. as They master fake transfer as another set of procedures. Mm -hmm. And then they give us this awful right. simulation of integrative <laughs> thinking because we've already ruled out genuine integrative thinking because yeah. it would ruin our disciplines, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, really, I mean, it's, it's yeah. uh, so I'm warming to my topic here, but I, I think that to, to model the ability to be surprised, getting back to what we were talking mm -hmm. about earlier, to model the ability to be dizzy with the possibility of a new idea is a vital thing to do in front of students yeah. because it demonstrates that, that, that integrative uh, thinking, that transfer, right. is actually going on in your own mind. Right. Well, what it, so one of the things he mentioned, the, the specific example he gave was his, his son skateboarding. Yes. And his son skateboarding, he can get interested in oh, Newtonian okay. physics. Yes, I remember that. But how do you make the le leap to quantum mechanics? Right. And so I was a little bothered at that moment because mm -hmm. I wanted to see more interest in skateboarding. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And I'm not a skateboarder, but yeah. I have students who bring their long boards to class. Yeah. And I also, so Atul Gawande talks about this uh, in, a, in the end of a really good book called Better. And he talks about how to be a positive deviant. And one of his prescriptions is ask an unscripted question. So, and I'm not saying Christy doesn't do this with his son, and I know it's very challenging when you, mm -hmm. when you want I mean, my eldest son is not terribly interested in academics, never has been, very bright and capable person, but he's, he's not going to go and geek down on, mm -hmm. on, whereas I'll read a book about quantum mechanics, he might eventually, yeah. but, but he's more likely to go out and, and actually, you know, make a movie or whatever. Um, so I think that if you can find your way into a situation in which the skateboarding is honored fully and not just seen as a kind of a gateway to something, mm -hmm. then it becomes a gateway to something. Yeah. You, you can't Maybe. keep the connections from happening. Right. But, but that's tricky, and it, students, and again, I want to be very careful here. I, I, listening to Chris over the last two days has been completely mind-blowing for me, and I, he just, he, he may look like the little professor, but <laughs> no, he's, no. he's just getting better and better, and today's talk, I thought, was fantastic. Yeah, was so, so let me talk about my own uh, son. I think that's probably better. Um, <laughs> so when, when he says that he's going to... Um, Comic-Con, let's say, or, or Otacon, or one of the cons that he goes to dresses up like people yeah. from internet, you know, uh, environments that I, I, and I'm pretty internet savvy, but I don't even, you know, I don't know. I wasn't a strong, bad fan, you know, and although I like it fine, but it wasn't my culture, right? So I wouldn't, um, I, I have disastrously in the past tried to make a certain transfer happen because I get concerned. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, th th at a certain level, this doesn't seem to be bearing down. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but uh, but I'm convinced after years of parenting that I you know maybe I, I need to bone up on Comic Con a little more because there's a 
the activity of meaning making, I don't yeah. even know if this is answering your question, but it's, it's constantly present. And, and I'm, I'm old enough to remember that the Beatles were roundly dismissed oh, no. uh, when <laughs> they came on the scene, and that was a mistake. I don't want to be the guy who didn't hire the Beatles. You know? <laughs> that, and, that will happen all over again, I mean, because we, we tend to be prone to errors. So no matter how, how not prejudiced we are. But what, what he was talking about actually made me think, why should we actually want this transfer to happen? In, in a sense, to me, it's enough, and I did that, I tried to do that with my, my own daughters, I mean, to focus on reasoning, to focus on analytic ability, to focus on creative, and at the same time, uh, deep thinking. Now, w the, the subject of that thinking is of no importance to me. It may be biology or quantum mechanics, or it may be music. It, mm. To me, it's, it's irrelevant, that thing. Why should we do that? As you say, perhaps if we teach or if we model deep, creative, and analytic thinking, then it, it will come. So to pursue that, they must, students must pursue an interest a passionate interest into something, and then things will develop. No, I think say. that's key. There has to be a passionate interest. I don't want to be in the position of saying that every aspect of culture is just as valuable as every other aspect of culture. I don't, I think there is trash culture, although that's yeah. interesting in its yeah. way. I mean, yeah. there, I'm not saying that there are no trivial sure. things in this world, of although course. sometimes I wonder. Um, <laughs> but but I think it's it's also, as you say, the thing to do is to understand that that passion is not utilitarian. It's an, it's an engagement with being, mm -hmm. and that has to be honored. Right, and, that's, and that creates this really sort of deep learning process yes. about figuring out who you are and how you position yourself in the world. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, it's, it's a practice in wisdom, really, you know? And like, I, I mean, I was part of uh, skating, not skateboarding culture, but uh, rollerblade culture. Yeah. Like, and I was like, <laughs> you know, back in the day. But I remember very distinctly, like, how much I learned about just being me in that time, you know, and about, uh, in, in the art of rollerblading, you might say, like, and, you know, it's a full body experience kind of thing. Wow, just being me. I think it, <laughs> just being time, but it's a wonderful way to finish this. Yeah. I think it's the, the perfect time. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank that you. Was fun. Thank you so no, much. It was a real pleasure.